Lawyers of Reddit, what's your best most bad I rest my case moment? Story 1. I took a pro bono case. My client paid me in boxes of strawberries. It was a farmer who was mistakenly accused of burning his own house down. I knew he was innocent. A suspected motive in the case was finances. Client insisted on taking the stand in a motion hearing. The prosecutor asked my client how he got the money to pay for his attorney's legal fees. He said, strawberries. I held up that morning's payment to show the judge. Case wasn't dismissed right then and there, but the prosecutor looked so stupid and the eventually the case was dismissed. Story 2. Corporate lawyer. But this was on a pro bono housing matter. My client just needed to not lose her housing. I was trying to get her on one-year probation, but would agree to two instead of termination. On the day of the hearing, I had six summer associates come with me, each carrying huge binders. When my hearing was about to begin, I had them all bring them in and sit them in front of me. The opposing lawyer was a very overworked NYC housing attorney who had budgeted an hour that day for my hearing. She instantly goes, what is this? I told her it was my arguments. She said she didn't have the time. I started off on a two-minute opening I had prepared, then grabbed one of the binders, and she was like, let me stop you there. What do you want? I said three months probation. She countered with a year. Ended up agreeing on six months. The binders were all empty. Story three. Not a lawyer, but was working with our corporate lawyers on a patent infringement case. I was an engineer specializing in the technology in question, a document scanning system. At the time, we had a relationship with a company that provided OEM products for our lower-end scanning market. And in the meantime, we were working on a higher-end machine of our own design. As our new design was getting ready for market, they accused us of violating one of their patents. The wording of the patent in question was very, very broad and it indeed looked bad for us. They invited us to their HQ to discuss the issue and potential remedies. Best case, licensing fees, worst case, back to the drawing board. We had met several times before the trip to prep, and despite the efforts of our engineering team, we could not find a hole in the patent. We flew out to their HQ, and upon landing, met one more time in the hotel lobby. We were prepared for the worst. It was then that I noticed some wording in the patent that was quite specific about the way that the document scanning surface was held in place while the scanning head moved. Their patent described the surface resting on fixed rails, with the scanning head moving beneath it. However, because we were very concerned about maintaining a constant focal distance from the scanning head to the document, our scanning surface was captured by the head itself, not the rails, so that the document surface would freely track any minor up and down or twisting motion of the head due to rail deflection or dirt or what have you. In fact, if the head was not present in the machine, the scanning surface would just fall into the bottom of the unit. Well, the lawyers looked at me in shock. We talked it through and they started grinning and soon we were all smiling like idiots. It was bulletproof. We went into the meeting. They had their corporate lawyers, engineers, and business sector managers. And after all the righteous outrage was expressed, along with the desire to somehow find a way forward and maintain a good working relationship, blah, 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 it was show and tell time. Our lawyer simply said, we don't believe that we violate your patent. And using the prototype that we had brought along, I showed them why. It was beautiful. They just sat there at first. Then their technical guys asked me to show them again. Then they left to have a private conference. We just tried to keep it professional while we waited, but we knew we had them. They came back all apologies, saying how they hoped that our fruitful partnership could continue as it had been so successfully before, etc. When we left, we went straight to a nearby bar and celebrated. By the end of the night, our straight-laced corporate attorney was all, I love you guys, man. It was a great day. Story 4. My client and his wife were woken up one night because people were trying to break into his house. He fired two warning shots as his wife called 911. The neighbor also called 911. When the police got the neighbor's call that there were shots fired, the police sergeant radioed the other officers and said, He's going to jail tonight, referring to my client. So obviously, even with signs of someone trying to break in, and his wife calling 911 for help, the officers arrest my client for endangering his wife by shooting inside the house, nowhere near her. It gets to a jury trial, and I start to go off on the police sergeant about why she would say that before an investigation, and before she even had any idea what happened. The sergeant had no idea how to respond, and literally just sat there staring at me for a solid two minutes before saying anything. Even the bailiffs were audibly laughing. Story 5. Several years ago, there was a big candy bust in my town, where the cops arrested about a dozen people in this garage and charged them with manufacture delivery possession with intent to deliver a controlled substance, candy dealing, conspiracy, and criminal organization, known as RICO in other places. I was appointed to represent one of the people found in the building when the Candy Task Force raided the place. 
the police filed an eight-page affidavit of probable cause, most are one to two pages for most other cases, detailing their surveillance of this criminal enterprise and the comings and goings of various participants and their roles in the enterprise. I read all eight pages and realized that the only place my client's name appeared was on page seven, where it said, the following individuals were present at the garage when the warrant was executed. Person one, person two, person three. So he was there the day the Candy Task Force raided the place, but there was no mention of his involvement in the criminal enterprise. His bail was set at $250,000, which is ridiculously high, and the district attorney refused to agree to a lower amount at his preliminary hearing. I filed a motion for bail reduction and showed up at the hearing loaded for bear. The DA calls the case, I approach the front, and the judge jumps right in before I could even open my mouth. Usually counsel makes their arguments first. The judge asks any questions of us he has, then he makes his decision. The judge looks directly at me and says he's read the affidavit of probable cause. He says what is alleged in there is pretty serious and a big deal in our small town. He noted how the task force had the place under surveillance for weeks to build their case, which ultimately resulted in their raid. And if the allegations can be proven, the defendants are facing some serious consequences. But he says, now turning to face the DA, he saw that my client's name appeared only once in the entire affidavit, and it makes no mention of his involvement in the candy enterprise. The judge asks the DA, why shouldn't I grant defense's motion for bail reduction? The DA stammers, uh, 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 we have uh, evidence that this defendant was uh, involved with picking up the material from Philadelphia and transporting it here. The judge looks at her again and says, did I miss that in the affidavit? She replies, no, they just recently found that out. The judge turns to me and asks me if I have anything to add. There I was, fully prepared to make this passionate argument for why my client's bail should be reduced. The deficiencies in the affidavit, my client's advanced age, his lack of a criminal record in the past 20 years, etc. I stood there trying my best not to smirk and said, I have nothing to add, Your Honor. Motion granted, bail reduced. Story 6. Pro bono unlawful detainer, eviction case. My client's apartment building changed owners and the new owners collected rent by stopping by and picking up a check. They wanted my client out, so they didn't pick up a check from her. They then tried to evict her for non-payment of rent. The written lease provided an address for mailing the rent. The new owners had vacated that address, and her check was returned by the post office. It was postmarked and sealed. I had no idea what was really in it. But my client wasn't the scheming kind. I presented as unopened postmarked envelope and asked the judge to open it and see what was inside. Obviously, it contained a rent check. Case over. The judge apologized about the meager fees he could toward me. Story 7. ENL, but I was pretty proud of this. Got a parking ticket for parking in an unmetered space. Yes, you read that, right? I'd parked in what would normally be a metered space, but the parking meter had been removed and there was just an empty pole. I tried contesting online and got refused, so went to court. The meter guy was called up to testify and he reported that he'd seen me in the space on such and such a day at such and such a time. Judge asked me if I wanted to cross-examine. I said no. Judge asked me if I had parked there. I said yes. Judge ruled I was guilty and I asked if I could ask a question. He said yes. What ordinance was I cited against, Judge asked the meter guy. All he said was that it wasn't allowed to park there and that he'd seen me park there several days in a row for longer than the allowed time in a metered zone and decided it was time to cite me. I kept my mouth shut. Judge asked the prosecutor what the ordinance was. He didn't know. Judge asked the clerk to look it up. They didn't find one. I knew they wouldn't because I'd done my research beforehand. Judge ruled not guilty. He also laughed and told me I was better at keeping my mouth shut when I should than many lawyers he'd seen. Presumably because had I admitted to parking longer than the allowed time in a metered zone, he could have cited me there for that. In retrospect, I should have asked the question when the judge asked if I wanted to cross-examine the meter guy, but it was still a really satisfying outcome. Story 8. When I was around 16, I worked as a test shopper, so I'd end up in court sometimes to testify that someone had sold me cigarettes. There was one time where a man was claiming he had sold me cigarettes because the compliance officers never tried to properly train him as a store owner. The officers told him they tried to call him several times, and he was being incredibly difficult to get a hold of. The officers even had a ridiculous amount of notes that described all the times they tried to contact him. When they pointed out all this to him, his defense turned into, I don't own a phone, so it was up to them to try something else to train me. With absolutely perfect timing, his phone starting audibly ringing in his pocket the second he finished saying he didn't own one. Our side's lawyer is now a judge, and she still says that was one of the most perfectly timed things that's ever happened to her. Story 9. I'm not a lawyer, but the most memorable court scene I witnessed was 1968, Sacramento K. 
I was waiting to be tried in traffic court, my usual speeding, before Earl Warren Jr., the son of the great Earl Warren of Supreme Court fame. The guy before me was being tried for reckless driving. When it got down to sentencing, Earl Warren Jr. ordered some nominal fine and that the defendant attend traffic school. The defendant got all upset and began ranting how he didn't need to go to traffic school. As the defendant slowed down, Earl Warren Jr. calmly stated, Well, sir, I cannot make you attend traffic school. I can only issue the order for you to attend. If I find after two weeks you have not attended, I will issue a warrant for your arrest and place you in county jail for 30 days, at the end of which I will renew the order for you to attend traffic school. So we can keep you going in and out of jail until you decide to attend traffic school. The guy just grumbled and walked out of court. Don't know if he did go. I certainly did when I got a similar sentence. Story 10. I worked in the legal department of a public school district while I was in law school. Because of changes in the laws regarding the foods and snacks that could be made available to students, for example, sugar content, the district was seeking to renegotiate its contract with one of the food beverage vendors. The contract was with a local subsidiary of a global corporation that you have definitely heard of prior to the end of the contract term. The other side took this contract so seriously that they sent an attorney from their home office to meet with us in our office and he threatened to take the school district to court for breach of contract as they did not want to renegotiate the contract or change the terms. He was apparently not accustomed to dealing with school districts or any kind of governmental entities for that matter. My boss, the general counsel, had asked me to figure out how to get the district out of that contract, so I researched state law regarding contracts with governmental entities as a starting point. Since the school district was established under state law and was a state governmental entity, it was also, by law, immune from lawsuits for breach of contract. It was extremely satisfying to point out to him that we were immune to such suits, but that he was welcome to attempt to bring one and be laughed out out of court. We later negotiated a new contract that was favorable for both parties. Story 11. I have two that I like to share. I'll apologize up front for the length of my response. The first involved a lawsuit against the owner of a Mexican restaurant for not paying his employees and keeping the waiter's tips. He was just a terrible all-around guy. He created these fake handwritten schedules and payroll records going back years to try and prove that his employees didn't work but a few hours each week and were paid for what they did work. It was difficult to prove they were fakes, but we managed to trap him during his deposition. I made the guy go through random bits of his work schedule and asked him to confirm they were correct. We did a random week in February, March, April, then we got to May. So here in early May, you had two servers working every night, one hostess, one bartender, and two cooks. Yes, and that didn't fluctuate. You didn't have a need for extra staff on, say, weekend nights? No. It was very steady no matter the day. What about on this Wednesday? How much staff did you need? Just the two servers, my hostess, the bartender, and two cooks. The same as every other night. And if you would indulge me, what date are we looking at? May 5th, okay? So it's your testimony under oath that you had the same staffing needs on May 5th as you did on May 4th and May 6th. Yeah, opposing counsel's head begins to hang while shaking. So you are comfortable telling the judge you didn't do extra business on May 5th. Yeah, or June 17th or whatever date you pick. It was always steady. You have no problem walking into court and telling the judge and the jury under oath that your Mexican restaurant didn't need any extra help on May 5th. That these schedules and payroll records you've produced are 100% accurate. For Cinco de Mayo? You are totally comfortable with doing that? Yeah, I... Oh. The case settled within a week. Story 2. State law enforcement was trying to prosecute a local cop for accessing name and address information for an individual in the state's criminal justice computer system to help a friend who was a process server. The state was prosecuting the cop for violating the Computer Crimes Act, which in part makes it illegal to share any information which the state has an intellectual property interest in. We show up for trial, having waived our right to a jury, and allow the head of the Attorney General's litigation department to make this wonderfully colorful speech about a police officer breaking the public trust and this other nonsense. For our opening statement, we move to dismiss the indictment on the grounds that the state's theory of the case is a legal impossibility. The state cannot have an ownership interest in someone's name or address. The judge was annoyed with our tactic and put the screws to us by asking dozens of questions. But we kept repeating our theory. The state cannot own a name or address as intellectual property. Finally, the judge gets it and turns to question the AG. He tries to dance his way out of answering the big question all sorts of ways. Eventually, the judge flat out asked him if he contends the state can own someone's name or address. The AG responded by saying, Judge, I came here to try a case, not to argue the law. The judge was not impressed and dismissed the case immediately and wrote a letter to the Attorney General asking him to be more selective in his prosecutions.
That was a fun day in court. Story 12. Back when I was a prosecutor, I had a defendant object that I couldn't compel him to give a fingerprint sample for comparison. It's how we proved up prior convictions. Our expert would fingerprint the defendant outside the presence of the jury, and in the presence of the jury, compare fingerprints to the ones included on old judgments. This is 101% BS because fingerprints aren't testimony and can be compelled. But the judge for the day was actually buying the argument. So I stood up, told the judge I was applying for a search warrant, and asked to be sworn in. She swore me in, I applied for a warrant, and she wrote out a warrant return for his fingerprints. No longer with a valid objection, the defendant was fingerprinted, and surprise, surprise, his four prior felonies were indeed his. He's serving life now. His crime? Two weeks after getting out of prison, he bought some cola, which he then mainlined, which he then drove on, and while driving, ran a stop sign. When an officer tried to pull him over, he fled, and threw his cola and needles out the window into a residential neighborhood, where he crashed his car into a house. So when the, the officer got out to check on him, he tried to run the officer over. The officer, him in the chest, and then performed life-saving first aid until the paramedics could get there. Story 13. Not a lawyer, but this is my favorite story in traffic court. I got a ticket for going 75 miles per hour on I-88 near Chicago. The officer wrote on the ticket I was going 88 miles per hour on I-75, Detroit south to Miami, not near Chicago. I show up wearing a suit because I have one suit, and I may as well wear it. Judge calls on me asking me if I'm a lawyer. I say I am not, but I get to go first because I'm the only one in a suit. Judge looks at the ticket, says, You were going 88 on I-75? Officer X, what does this ticket say? Isn't I-75 out of our jurisdiction? At this point, I open my mouth and shut it, because I have the right to remain silent. May as well show the ability to be silent as well. Officer says, Your Honor, at my age, I have no idea what I wrote. Judge gives him a look and throws my license back at me in the plastic bag, says, You are free to go. Always wear a suit to traffic court. Story 14. I and Al, and I've told this story before, but it always makes me smile. Wall of text incoming. I was in court to get more placement for my two kids. My ex-wife and her sister were claiming all sorts of things, that I was abusive and a stalker and A and on and on and on. Like, to give you an example of what they were pulling, they claimed that I choked my daughter and then they brought her to the doctor in October 2016. The doctor brought in a second doctor and they both looked at these marks on her neck and were like, hmm... We can't exactly call the police for this because it's unclear. I pulled the doctor's records, and the appointment never even happened. So there were a few moments. One was that they were claiming that I angrily hauled my son out of their house because he wouldn't put on his shoes or coat in the wintertime. Now, while I did take him out of the house, it was because they had been arguing for 10 minutes with a 4-year-old about putting on shoes and a coat in winter. They had only gotten his shoes on, so I picked him up and took him to the car. Then he stopped me and wanted to put on his coat. So, this was their big moment. He looked so angry and hauled son out of the house. My attorney has my ex's sister on the stand. She's already unsteady on the stand, muttering and not answering questions clearly and trying to lie without lying. So, my attorney asks, Why did you think it was unnecessary for Bruce Lee 1,255 to carry son out of the house? She says, Because you can reason with son. He's four. You really think you can reason with him? Yes. So, in this case, did it work? She froze, like literally froze. For about five seconds, she didn't say a thing. Five seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're on the stand and everyone is staring at you, it's interminable. Finally, she said, well, it usually does, but in this case, did it work? Well, it usually does, he moved on. But the best part, and the one where I could have flown, was toward the end of the trial. So, my ex spent eight hours spread out over days ripping apart my character. I was a, an abuser, violent. But also one time I sent my daughter home with dog poop on her shoe. Murder, arson, and jaywalking is what we called it. Like, if he's so violent, why are you even complaining that one time she had dog poop on her shoe? Anyway. So, after all this time, she still never explained why she thought my daughter couldn't have more time with me. She made a lot of hints, but never nailed down any reasons in any communication she sent to me. Even in her deposition, she didn't say anything about abuse. So finally, my attorney nails her down on the last day, and she says that she's afraid that my daughter won't know that mommy's going to come back. Basically, that my daughter lacked object permanence. The judge asks her a few questions. He says, so are your son and daughter close? Oh, yes, very close. Does daughter miss him when he goes to school? Oh, yes, very much so. So, does she miss him because she loves him, or miss him because he's not coming back? Oh, she knows he's coming back. Okay. In the span of a minute, she torpedoed her entire argument. Her attorney saw it right away, but she didn't. They tried flailing around in the closing arguments, but it was all over and I got more time with my children. Story 15. I'm not a lawyer, but a few years back I was sued by an old landlord. It went like this. 
About a year after I moved out, I was contacted by a collection agency saying that I hadn't paid last month's rent. Instead of looking into it at the time, like I should have, I sent a check directly to my landlord and thought nothing else of it. A few years after that, I was contacted by an attorney saying that I had to appear in small claims court for an unpaid bill. I reached out to find out what I was supposed to have not paid. It was the same oh no bill. On top of the bill, they add legal fees, court costs, late payment fees. $1,200 turned into over $5,000 on this claim. It was nuts. This time I do my research. I go to my bank and find every single signed check from the months that I lived there. I was only there a year. I noticed at this time that when I paid the unpaid rent that I was put into collections over a few years earlier wasn't needed at all. I had proof that I had paid 12 months of rent, a security deposit that they never returned on time every month. I immediately panic and think, cow, they have been putting this against my credit all these years. I had for a credit report and nothing was there. I'm good at paying my bills. The week before I'm in court, however, they start putting past due payment against my credit. My credit tanks! I attempted to reach out to them several times to let them know that I had paid and I could prove it. They never responded. So the day of the hearing arrives, and I'm waiting for my turn and this slug of a human calls me aside? She seriously looked like Roz from Monsters, Inc. I assume she's with the courthouse or something, so I go over. She's the lawyer trying to collect. She hands me a piece of paper saying that if I lose today, that I'll owe as much as $10,000 and they would make it all go away if I agree to payment 15 payments of $150. I said no thank you and walked out. We are seen by the judge and she talks for what seemed like hours about how I was an irresponsible tenant and the hardships the landlord had to go through to get paid. She droned on forever. I was fuming. Then it was my turn to speak. I handed in the paperwork that I had which showed that I had paid for all 12 months as well as my bank statements showing they cleared payments and sat down. The slug didn't know I had this information. She was white as a sheet. I also informed that judge that she had taken me aside and tried to get me to pay them directly without seeing the judge. The judge was livid, chewed her out for a solid three or four minutes. Story 16. I'm not a lawyer, but worked as a court reporter for a small town paper. I covered a case where a man strangled his wife to death after she was caught cheating. His defense lawyers were arguing for a manslaughter charge, arguing that the crime was done in a heat of passion. The prosecutor, who were seeking first-degree murder, stood in silence for two minutes and 50 seconds, the exact amount of time he strangled. Prosecutor said, that's plenty of time for him to reflect on what he's doing. Everyone in the courtroom knew it was over at that point. Story 17. Judge, if I just grant your motion to dismiss the case, wouldn't your motion to strike the plaintiff's affidavit be moot? Me. Uh, yes, your honor. Judge, okay, I don't think I need to hear any more arguments on the motion to strike. Me. I have no further argument regarding the motion to dismiss either. Thank you, Your Honor. Story 18. My eight-word trial would be up there. Basically, my lowest ever effort court hearing win. I was required to say a grand total of eight words during the whole thing. The defendant's lawyer has messed up up, spectacularly, and has tried ineptly to get his client and himself out of the cow. He spends about an hour ranting and raving about the injustice of it all, screaming at the judge that he's got it wrong, while I sit, half-listening, casually browsing reddit using the court wi-fi eventually he gives up and the judge says something like for reasons i'm going to dismiss this application anything to add you count zapolai no word one okay application dismissed for reasons how much are your costs Twelve thousand pounds plus vat a uk sales tax words two six granted good morning thank you words seven and eight story 19 anytime you win a motion for a judgment of acquittal is pretty fun an MJOA is a motion the criminal defense attorney makes immediately following the conclusion of the prosecution's case. The motion is essentially saying, even if you believe all of the prosecutor's evidence, including the testimony of their witnesses, you still cannot convict my client. I had a case recently where the prosecutor failed to establish that the incident occurred within the court's jurisdiction. So because the prosecutor failed to ask its witnesses, where did this occur? Or something along the lines of, did these events happen in X county? I win. It feels like a gotcha tactic or exploiting a loophole, but I can almost guarantee that the prosecutor won't make that mistake again. Also, it is a great feeling when the state rests and you know you have the trial in the bag. Story 20. This was really an aha moment about stereotypes. Our client was a Spanish-speaking young man from Ecuador who had come to the U.S. on a visa for a job at an orchard in Florida. He also ended up working weekends in construction where his hand was off in an accident. We sued the manufacturer of the equipment. At trial, defendant's lawyer sneered at our client about his estimated damages and asked about his education and work history. The client testified that he took college courses in Ecuador before coming to work in the orchard. 
and that his goal was to be a full-time computer analyst. Defendant's lawyer, you may have been working in Ecuador toward becoming a computer analyst, but the fact is that up to the date of your accident, you only held minimum wage jobs picking fruit and doing construction work in the United States. Isn't that right, the client? No, sir. I was in charge of the computer system at the orchard. I never picked fruit. There was silence in the court. We couldn't rest our case, but it sure was a wake-up call for defendants who had never considered this possibility. We won. The jury awarded $2.5 million in damages. And just to clarify for those who don't already know, damages are often calculated based upon a plaintiff's potential lifetime earnings, which is why it matters whether an accident prevents you from earning minimum wage or whether it keeps you from a job with the potential for much higher earnings. Story 21. I witnessed this sitting in court. It was a candy case, and there was some discussion between the prosecutor, defense attorney, and the judge about the quantity. Judge says something like, Right, but that's in ounces. How many grams is that? Prosecutor and defense attorney say they don't know. Judge says, I mean, we can figure it out. How many grams are in an ounce? Prosecutor and defense attorney still shrug like, Dunno. All of a sudden, the defendant pipes up, 28.3, story 22. I had a criminal case on appeal. The defendant had broken some guy's arm and got convicted of assault, aggravated by serious bodily injury. The only thing his lawyer was challenging on appeal was whether a broken arm was enough for the aggravator. In my state, serious bodily injury can be established one of five ways. When the other attorney filed his brief, it was just 20 pages of him arguing why a broken arm did not establish the third way, and only the third way. In my brief, I said that's fine and dandy, but it totally meets the fifth way. Finally, the day for court comes and we go to argue in front of a panel of judges. The other attorney gets up and says, Well, I hadn't really thought about it the way that Sir Buffness 12 put it, and I guess it does meet that fifth way. But you should still reverse his conviction. When he gets done arguing, the judges turn to me and ask if I wanted to argue. I asked if they wanted to hear from me, and they said, I don't think that's necessary. Closest moment to a mic drop that I've ever gotten. Story 23. I have a couple good ones. One was when I was a judicial extern over the summer. My job was to read and summarize moving papers in family court and make a recommended ruling and summarize the law behind it. They're all just called orders to show cause for underscore, 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 unless there's an actual motion to compel or an emergency. Most family court parties in L.A. County represent themselves, so the moving papers are always informed. E.g., Dear Judge, I'd like custody of Sally on extra day a week. Dear Judge, I lost my job and I can't pay this much child support, etc. One rubbed me the wrong way. It went something like, Dear Judge, I would like to have my daughter overnight on Mondays so I can take her to school on Tuesdays because I don't work until the afternoon on Tuesday. I told the judge something didn't sit right. We had no record of this man having a job and his ex opposed the change, so my recommended ruling was to deny. Judge disagreed and said he'd at least let the man argue his case in court. They show up the next day, and Mom explains that she can't change the custody arrangement on Mondays because she works and can't do drop-off those evenings. She's being reasonable and wants her kid to have a dad, so she suggests they do Tuesday or Wednesday nights instead. Judge says that sounds fair. Dad says, oh no, judge, my gang meets at my house on those nights. It's not safe. Judge then turns around and removes custody from his home entirely and arranged supervised visits only. Gangbanger dad then tries to jump over the courtroom table and attack the judge. We're all ordered to duck and cover and gangbanger goes away in cuffs. He went from almost getting an extra day with his kid to no custody and being arrested in all of five minutes. I told the judge something was off. This one ended up way too long, so I'll save the other story from a civil trial I did for later. Story 24. I got a guy off who was facing a five-year prison sentence by asking the alleged victim whether she kept a toothbrush at his house. I had this client, Gene, and I represented him in three child support matters. Yep, three different moms. Two dependency matters, like child protective services, and at least four criminal matters. Gene didn't have any money, so when he got in trouble, he'd ask the judge to appoint me as his attorney. Gene was a combat vet who did four or five tours in the Middle East. He was completely broken by the experience, and the VA just screwed the guy over and over again. So one day I get a call from Gene. He's been arrested for domestic abuse. He's alleged to have thrown objects at his girlfriend, plates, a vase, beer bottles, etc. Gene has three prior assaults on his record, including one domestic. So instead of looking at probation and a week in jail, Gene's now looking at going upstate for five years. Gene tells me the story. He picked up Veronica at the bar a week before he was arrested. Veronica was married and lived in a house behind Gene, and for the week before he was arrested, Veronica was hopping the fence to run over to Gene's house. She'd get loaded and then hop the fence again before her husband came home. According to Gene, they'd made out and stuff, but they'd never had close relationship. In Iowa, 
The domestic element of a domestic abuse claim requires that the parties live together, have a child in common, were once married, or are currently having close relationship. So, I got myself appointed to the case, and I moved to have the state pay for expenses related to deposing Veronica. I scheduled the deposition with the county attorney, prosecutor. Veronica had been telling the county attorney that she and Jean were in a relationship. When I sit down to depose Veronica, I ask her two questions. Have you ever slept with my client? Do you have a toothbrush at my client's home? She answers no to both. I take a break and have a chat with the county attorney. She agrees to let Jean plead out to a disorderly, a $65 fine. That was the shortest deposition I've ever taken. Story 25. You know, but I saw the best court moment ever. So there is this person I know that was charged with murder. He was very young and is on the spectrum. After several hours of interrogation, he gave a false confession. The confession was complete cow and contained details that were easy to prove as false. The defendant's lawyer is questioning the detective that was involved in the interrogation. It comes out that the detective attended a training course on how to interrogate suspects just three months before the defendant was arrested. It in the detective was supposed to learn a specific technique that prevents false confessions. This technique was clearly not used when the defendant was questioned. L. So you learned specific technique but didn't use it. Did you not really learn the technique? D. Um, I don't understand the question. I learned about specific technique at the training course. I know how to use specific technique, L, but you didn't use it. You are aware that the style of interrogation you used leads to false confessions? D. I don't know what you want me to say, L. So did you forget something you learned three months ago? Or did you purposely not do what you were supposed to because you wanted the defendant to be guilty, no matter what the truth is? D. I don't understand the question. L. Are you bad at your job because you are incapable of learning? Or is it because you don't want to find the real culprit? The lawyer backed the detective into a corner for five minutes of what I'll paraphrase as, Are you stupid? Or are you corrupt? There was no other option. Eventually, the lawyer took pity on the dumb cop and let him get off the witness's stand. The defendant was acquitted. Story 26. Not in trial, but in settlement negotiations. I'm chatting with an adjuster on a trip in fall where I had major notice concern. Porch railing broke and a kid got hurt. But it wasn't clear whether anyone ever complained about the condition of the railing before the fall to necessitate a repair. Adjuster tells me, you know, we've had repair folks out to the house, and they said that a lot of people hang out there, sitting on that railing and stuff. So you're telling me your workers were aware of and specifically noted concerns about the safety of that railing, and nobody ever repaired it? Easiest negotiation I ever had after that. Story 27. I was a young prosecutor working a DUI case. The defendant was a veteran and did not take the stand although he had his veteran's hat sitting on counsel table angled at the jury the whole trial. Anyway, the basic facts are the same as always. Guy is pulled over for poor driving, cop smells liquor, does field sobriety tests, defendant refuses breath tests, and we are off to trial. The defense posited in opening statements that the defendant suffered from PTSD and anxiety, and that the symptoms of an anxiety attack could be confused with drunkenness. They put a witness on the stand to say as much, and my cross-examination went something like this. So, sir, you say that when the defendant has an anxiety attack, his face becomes red and puffy? Yes. And his eyes become watery and bloodshot? Yes. His speech can become thick and slurred? Yes. And his breath stinks like liquor? Jury started laughing, and I knew I had them. Rested my case right there. Story 28. Not my story, but my wife's. She was defending a lawsuit which was now on appeal, and she had already filed her written argument called a factum here. About a week before the hearing, opposing counsel, O.C. called her, trying to settle. O.C., here's my proposal. We will drop our suit if you'll pay us $100,000. W., you haven't read my factum yet, have you? O.C., no. Why? W., call me back after you read my factum. A few days passed, then he called back. O.C., here's my proposal. We will drop our suit if you don't ask us to pay your costs. Story 29. This moment was less a feat of my own than a complete and utter failure by the state's attorney. I work in immigration, and I had this client that was seeking asylum. The state prosecutor laid out the case for why my client could be deported back to his country of birth, Ethiopia, without fear of harassment or persecution. It was a fairly well-presented case, but with one major flaw. As soon as he finished, I told the judge, The city my client was born in is now part of Eritrea. Ethiopia has no bearing on this case. The state prosecutor failed to do basic research on Ethiopian history and didn't realize that the country of Eritrea gained independence from Ethiopia in 1991, after my client was born. So even though the client's birth certificate says he was born in Ethiopia, the city he was born in is now in Eritrea. So that is where he would be deported to, and that is where the human rights violations would matter. The prosecutor had nothing prepared on Eritrea, 
I have never seen a judge tear into a state attorney harsher than on that occasion. The poor guy was shrinking in his seat under the judge's scathing chastisement. I almost felt bad for him, but he was completely at fault. Needless to say, my client won the case. Story 30. Criminal Defense Attorney During a high-stakes close relationship crime trial, I had occasion to call a police officer to the stand during my case in chief. He was mostly called to authenticate video that his body camera took. I ask him some questions and then play the portion of the body cam that was relevant. The DA then gets to cross-examine him, and during that testimony he flat-out lies about something on another portion of the video. We have a very brief hearing to be allowed to play the other portion of the video, then play the video. After it was finished, I asked the cop only two questions that both were essentially the same thing. So you lied in your earlier testimony, right? So I didn't get to rest my case at that point. I had another witness. But I did get to destroy his credibility with two quiet questions. Story 31. NL. I was on the jury and it was the witness. They were talking about railroad track maintenance. A red flag is a bad section of a track. A yellow flag is a track section that needs attention. Lawyer. Sir, on this sheet, there are 9,000 red flags. Your railroad of the same distance and age only has 400. Why is that? Witness. Because I do my job so I don't have to sit in a courtroom to defend myself. I laughed. Everyone looked at me. The defense did not like that. Story 32. In California, it's customary to open a deposition with about 5, 10 minutes of admonitions, where you explain to the person what a deposition is, the effect of it, how it works, etc. Before going into super basic background questions, everybody prepares their client according to that outline, because that's how it always happens. I had a hunch that this lady was lying about how she fell out of a golf cart, and that her lazy attorney probably didn't prepare her very well. So I skipped all that, and as soon as she was sworn in the deposition went, Q, how did you fall out of the golf cart? A, I don't know. Q, counsel, do you want to just settle this now? Or do we have to waste the rest of the day too? Story 33. Not a lawyer, but I made the stenographer laugh. I was an expert witness in a patent lawsuit. It was just a deposition, not a courtroom. I was representing the IT department and just answering mundane questions on backup policies, server names, and other boring details. Opposing counsel hadn't prepared well and was asking lots of nonsensical questions. My company's counsel had prepared me well and told me to just answer the question asked with no additional details. We'd been going along for a while with mundane questions and truthful but useless answers since they were asking the wrong questions, and the other attorney asked what was the difference between server X and server Z. I answered about three feet. The stenographer and several other people in the room laughed. What the other attorney was trying to ask was the difference in function of the two serve, but since they were used for identical purposes, the only difference was physical location. At the end of the deposition, the opposing attorney was really frustrated since they didn't get anything useful. But that's their fault since they'd asked the wrong question. I had information they would have liked to know, but they didn't ask the right questions. The patent lawsuit ended up being dropped a few years later since it was bogus like most patent lawsuits. Story 34. INL. But my friend is a cop, and this was his best moment in court defense lawyer. You gave my client a roadside breath test, and he failed cop. No defense lawyer. My client told me that he clearly remembers being given a roadside breath test. But this test is not mentioned in any of the evidence you provided or any of your transcripts. Cop. It's not mentioned because I did not give him a roadside breath test. I do not need to if I have evidence that a driver is under the influence of alcohol or sweets. Defense lawyer. What evidence do you have that my client was under the influence? Cop. When he eventually stopped the car, he opened the door and fell onto the road, dropping a half-full vodka bottle. He then got to his feet and fell over a garden fence. When I asked if he had been drinking, he admitted that he'd had a cow load of booze and demanded that I test him to see how far gone he was. Defense lawyer. Yet you still didn't offer him a roadside breath test? Cop. No, we did not have one available. When I explained this to your client, he took my radio off my vest and blew the antenna. He then held it up to me and asked how far gone he was. He then fell over again and threw up on his shoes. This was all captured on my body camera. They watched the video and there he was. Using a radio as a breathalyzer, Guy was found guilty and banned. Story 35. For once I have a relevant story. Many years ago, my girlfriend at the time had an ex who was a total shower bag. She breaks up with him and he starts harassing her for money that he spent on her for dates and such. Nothing extravagant, but like half the dinner he paid for kind of nonsense. He was friends with another girl who was a law student at the time at a local grade D law school diploma mill. Let's call her Nancy. They run into us one night in a club and Nancy starts going off on my girlfriend how she is about to be a lawyer. She is super well connected in the legal community and is friends with big shots in the local community like this guy we'll call Tom. She proceeds to tell me how Tom works at the most prestigious white shoe law firm in the city. 
Nancy says my GF must pay back shower bag his money or she's going to get Tom to rain legal fire and brimstone upon her. Now what Nancy doesn't know is that I'm a lawyer. Not only that, I also happen to work at White Shoe Firm and Tom is a friend of mine. I casually explain this to her and the fact that I'd just been in Tom's office shooting the breeze a couple hours ago, I don't recall your name ever coming up and why don't you tell me exactly who you are so I can go relay this conversation to Tom tomorrow morning. And here is my business card to prove to you what I'm saying is true and I'll be pleased to continue this nonsense conversation tomorrow, and we can talk about your fitness to practice law as well. You've never seen someone turn so white. Apologize. Turn a 180 and get the fudge out of there as fast as she could. It was glorious. That girlfriend is now my wife, and I'm pretty sure this moment is why she married me. Story 36. Not a lawyer, but I won a traffic court case with no words and just a piece of paper. I was given a ticket for reckless driving of 100 plus MPH at 2A on a Monday night after coming home from work. Problem being, my four-cylinder Chevy S10 had a governor on the engine that did not allow the car travel more than 87 miles per hour. Printed specs from Chevy and highlighted the line. Judge smirked and said I could go, but slow down, because something tells me you were still speeding. That moment of eye contact with the cop on the way out, priceless. Story 37, my law school trial advocacy class final. I was on the defense side. Neither witness for the prosecution identified the defendant. After they rested, I moved for a directed verdict because the prosecution failed to prove the defendant was the person who committed the crime. The judge granted my motion and said he would have in a real trial, but I still had to put on my side of the case. I got an A. Story 38. I was the defendant in a case in small claims court. When the fellow trying to get money from me stated his case, part of his claim was based on seeing a bank statement of mine where I had made a deposit of $1,000. I never even got so far as to point out that the money was from my fiancé's parents for wedding expenses as it came to light that the bank statement he saw was one that I'd never received, as he'd taken it from my mailbox. The moment of silence when he realized that he'd just told the judge that he'd committed a felony, stealing mail, was priceless. After that, it was basically a, maybe we should just forget this all happened and just go our separate ways agreement.